So Deuteronomy chapter 12, this evening get back in uh, to the book here. We're going to start there in verse 1 where it says, These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of your fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that you live upon the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess uh, serve their gods, upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and upon every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars, and break down their pillars, and burn their groves with fire. You shall hew, and you shall hew down uh, the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names out of them out of that place. You shall not do so unto the Lord your God. So, of course, this is God giving them the commandments of how they're to treat the heathen gods of the people who live in the land that they're going in to possess. And, you know, it's pretty obvious here from this, these few verses that, you know, God is not uh, an all-inclusive God. That God is not for this, what we would call today, ecumenicalism. And if you don't know what ecumenicalism is, basically that's the doctrine of, uh, that, that promotes the cooperation and better understanding among different religious denominations aimed at universal Christian unity. So this is something that we see uh, taking place in our day where people are saying, hey, it doesn't matter if we're Protestant or if we're Catholic, you know, if we're Baptist or Presbyterian or Lutheran, you know, we're all worshiping the same God. It's all the God of the Bible. So let's just put aside our doctrinal differences and let's just get along. And of course, notably, if we know anything about the Catholic Church, this was something that took place, I believe, back in the 60s. I'm no expert in the Catholic Church, you know, history, but it was a fairly, it might have been 50s or 60s, where they had Vatican II, where they began to roll out this doctrine where they're going to say, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to be more inclusive, you know, and you see that more and more now to the point where you even see uh, the Pope, you know, he's, he's uh, hanging out with, you know, the imams and every, and the, and the monks from the, the Buddhist temple and everything like that. He's, you know, it's, a, it's become a very ecumenical religion. And uh, that's why it's so difficult today is sometimes to, to get people saved when we go out. You know, we think about the Mormons. When we knock on the doors in these Mormon no neighborhoods, especially up in the Mesa area, <coughs> you know, the, they'll say, you know, I'll ask them, hey, are you a Christian? And they'll say, yeah. Well, oh, great. You go to church anywhere. Yeah, I go to the church of, uh, L I'm an LDS. You know, I go to the church of Latter-day uh, Saints. You know, and so you're, you're saying, well, technically you're not a Christian then. You're a Mormon. But it's, it's become so ingrained in our culture and everybody's thinking that, hey, Mormon is Christian. You know, Jehovah Witness is Christian. Catholicism is Christian. That this all is just falling under this huge umbrella of what we call Christianity today. And, you know, <clears throat> we have to be on guard for that because God, you know, God is not for this ecumenical philosophy. God is a God who, you know, cares about doctrine. You know, why, why else did he give us an entire book you know, explaining all the things uh, about him and about how he wants things done and how we should uh, conduct ourselves in worshiping him and, and everything like that. I mean, the Bible says that, you know, uh, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, right? So we should be paying attention to what it says. We shouldn't just put aside a doctrine. We'd say, like, like baptism, people will say today, well, what does it really matter, you know, that if they're sprinkling <clears throat> or if they're dunking, you know, if they're doing it when they're infants or when they've come to a, you know, whether or not they have come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Does it matter? Is it really that important? Is it more important than we just all get along? Well, no, because, you know, it's pretty important to God when, you know, he's got John the Baptist demonstrating how it's to be done. You know, and there's, and it all, it just leads, not just one area, there's just so many other areas where people want to blur the lines or doctrine or just remove them or just turn a blind eye and say, well, it's not that important. The important thing is that we just all learn to get along. <laughs> but the problem with that is that you start, you know, like, like we've seen over and over again, is that the bad make the good bad. You know, if we start dropping our standards and say, well, you know, it's okay if we hang out with the Methodist Church and, you know, we all serve the same God and, and uh, you know, we all, we all believe the Bible and, and so on and so forth. Well, you know what? They're the ones that are, are letting, you know, the sodomites behind the pulpit and letting the women behind the pulpit. Yeah. They're the ones that are going to start ushering in all these, these, these false doctrines. And if we're not careful, if we don't put up these walls of separation and say, no, no this is what the Bible says and we're not going to budge on it and we refuse to compromise, if we don't do that, you know, that's when people can start to sway and, 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 and uh, people start to compromise in their beliefs. So you say, oh boy, God takes a real harsh stand here on these, on these uh, heathen gods. I mean, what about just putting in a museum for posterity's sake and, you know, we could look back and, and uh, future generations could could, uh, you know, admire these, 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 these heathen pagan gods or whatever, you know, like people want to do today. You know, like they do over, 
It, well, where was that years ago? I remember it was a big deal. All these people were just up in arms about the fact that when, uh, I think it was in Afghanistan, the Muslims came in there and they blew up some, you know, thousand year old uh, carving of Buddha on some cliff. And everyone's just losing their minds over it. Like, I can't believe they do that. I say, well, I'm not for the Muslims, but hey, you know, <laughs> at least they've got some convictions about what they believe. You know, they probably, because, you know, they believe, well, they don't believe, but they read and understand the Old Testament. Well, I don't want to say they understand it, but they definitely try to adhere to it to some degree. They probably read that and were like, hey, we shouldn't have these heathen gods, you know. And, uh, <coughs> you know, I'm not, of course, saying that was, that we're, hey, you know, yay Muslims or anything like that. You know, they, they believe in a false god, too. Yeah. You know, <coughs> but uh, that's the stand God took on it here. I mean... <laughs> I mean, he was all about, you know, overthrowing their altars, just tearing them up, going there, just destroying them, breaking their pillars, burning their groves with fire. I mean, he's promoting you going out and being arson when it comes to these, you know, committing arson and, and when, you, uh, when it comes to these heathen gods. This is how extreme God uh, Stan takes on it. And we, you know, we call it extreme, but it's only because the world has gone so far from it yeah. and saying, you know what, God is a, is a God of separation. He's not for ecumenicalism. Because if we know our Bibles and we know what's going to happen in the end times, that the, the beast is going to uh, call, uh, you know, the, the, the second beast is going to call all, all to worship the image of the beast. You know, that, the, that all, uh, everyone's going to worship one God in the, in the last days. And we're heading towards a one world religion. And God is not for a one world religion. You know, he is when it's his religion. You know, he's, he's all for when Christ comes. There will be a one world religion when Christ comes and sets up his throne and rules with a rod of iron. You know, then, then we'll have a theocracy. But that'll be a right one. But God, in the meantime, you know, he's not for us just dropping our standards just, to, just for the sake of peace and getting along. Because, you know, the warning, and we'll, as we've read many times so far in Deuteronomy, is that if we do those things, you know, we're like, they're likely to end up influencing us for the worse. And that's what we see happening with the children of Israel, in fact. But <clears throat> what this shows us is that, you know, God, it's a God of separation, that God wants us to be different. He doesn't want us to all just, you know, throw our, our, all our hat in the same ring. He wants us to stand our ground and he wants us to have a difference. God is a God of separation. And if you would, turn over to Matthew chapter 10. So really, uh, what you see here is that, you know, separation you know, is necessary on two fronts. It's separation is necessary on two fronts, okay? One, separation is necessary for salvation, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean you have to live a separated life in order to get saved, okay? But you have to believe solely on Jesus Christ. All your faith has to be in Jesus. You can't put your faith in Jesus and so-and-so. You can't put your faith in Jesus and your good works. It's, it's Jesus or nothing, you know, he's so, he, is for, he is a God who is for separation. And when it comes to salvation, you have to, you know, deny everything else. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're trusting in your works, you have to turn from that. If you're trusting in, you know, you know, Muhammad or the Pope or whoever, you have to turn from those, those dead idols unto the living God. Amen. And uh, that's the type of separation that you need to have. It's all on Jesus and nothing else. And we're living in an age today where everyone just wants to add Jesus. They want to keep all their other false beliefs and just put Jesus there with them. And just say, oh yeah, I believe this and this. And of course, Jesus has a place too. You know, of course, I, you know, I'm not going to exclude him from my you know, smorgasbord of, of, of religious views. That's not how it works. God, I mean, did we not read Deuteronomy chapter 12? God says, no, take all those other ones off the shelf and put Jesus there alone. That's the kind of separation that we need to have when it comes to salvation. Jesus saith unto him in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, the life. Not a, a way, not, uh, you know, not some form of life, not a source of life, the life, the way. <clears throat> no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. So nothing's changed. You know, the God of the Old Testament is still a God of the New Testament. And he still you know, it, it insists on being exclusive when it comes to him being God. We can't have... Jesus and whatever else. It's him and nobody else. Look there in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. He said, Think not I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now I know it's during the Christmas season and we all want to sing, you know, peace on earth and goodwill to men. And, and certainly that is a message that's in the Bible that there one day will be peace on earth. But in the meantime, Jesus is saying, look, I came here to send a sword. 
And not a physical sword. Not a call to physical arms that we're going to go out and, you know, and, and, and take over a government and set up some you know, religious uh, hierarchy here on earth. He says, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and his daughter against his mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I don't think that he, they needed any help to begin with, but you know, it's there. And man's foes shall be they of his own household. So God is a God of separation. God is a God of division. He's not going to share his glory with another. He's not going to you know, let somebody else you know, get in on the, the glory that's due him because he's the only true and living God. So we see that separation is necessary for salvation. If you're going to try to go up any other way, Jesus said you're the same as a thief and a robber. You have to come in through the gate, through the door. There's no other way in. He is the way of salvation. Uh, so not only is it the separation in that sense, but it's also separation is necessary for the blessing of the Christian life. You say, well, I've separated myself unto Jesus Christ in the sense that I put all my faith in him for salvation. And you're saved. Well, amen. But, you know, separation goes beyond that. And this is when it becomes real work, is when you're going to live a separated life unto Christ. And I'm not saying, you know, we need to join a convent. We need to all just pack up and go buy 40 acres, you know, in, in Alabama or somewhere, where some, wherever they're all, is it Missouri, I think, is where they all go now, or where they buy all the land and, and start their... They're cults, and we're all just going to live on the same property and, you know, and just shun the world and everything like that. No, that's not what we're, we're preaching. But Jesus said to be in the world, but not of the world. You know, so we ne there needs to be a, a separation in the way we live our life. You know, we're not going to adopt the world's philosophies when it comes to you know, how we're going to live our life in, in all the areas that encompasses you know, marriage, child-rearing, education, uh, you know, entertainment, the things that we do with our spare time. Uh, what we're going to invest in, our, uh, you know, all of these things. You know, there's, there, it comes, it, there's no part of your life that the Bible doesn't touch and that God has a way for you to live your life. So we need to know what those things are and understand that God is a God of separation. You know, you can't just keep your, the, the altars of your old life and the, the pillars of your sin and the groves of, of all your bad habits and, 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 and have a blessed life too. God says, no, you've got to clear all that out. And that takes work. And then be separated unto me, and I will begin to bless you. If you would, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So separation is necessary not only for salvation, but separation is also essential for a being, living a blessed Christian life. We read about this a few weeks ago in 2 Corinthians 6, where it says, you're going to chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians, where it says, Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, which is another name for the devil? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Or what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. You know, that's a command in Scripture, that we should be separating from every false way in our life, and we should be separating ourselves unto Christ. And really, you know, you say, well, why, what's the big deal? What if I choose not to? You know, what if I choose to just continue living my old, worldly, sinful life and never cleaning myself up? And I know I'm saved, and we know that's true. That's not going to change. But I'm just going to continue to live an unseparated life. I'm just going to continue to be worldly in all my ways, have all my old, you know, uh, uh, relationships that are just uh, wicked and all of that. Well, you know, what that's going to do is it's going to provoke God to jealousy. It's not like God's just going to go, oh, you have it your way. I get, you know, I tried. No, it's going to provoke God to jealousy. Look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles uh, sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. So why is God telling them in Deuteronomy chapter 12 to go in there and just wipe all this out? Because whether they realize it or not, they're sacrificing those things to devils, like literal demons, devils, fallen angels. You know, these people back in Deuteronomy chapter 12, uh, these, these heathen of that land, you know, they probably thought they had their, in their imagination, oh, these are, these are gods. This is a form of God. They don't realize it's a fallen, wicked, evil, you know, demon <laughs> that they're worshiping. And that's what's saying here. He's saying, look, when you sacrifice unto, the, uh, your, uh, unto these, uh, these things, you're sacrificing unto devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't have it both ways. You know, and so many Christians get caught up in this. They have one foot in the world and one foot living for the Lord, one foot in church, so to speak. And you know what? The world 
and the world, rather, or the world, and, and living the Christian life are miles apart. And that's why Christians walk like this. They don't, and they go, why am I not making very much progress as a Christian? Because you've got one foot in the world, and you've got one foot in church. You're saying over on this side, oh, you know, Sunday and, Wednesday and Thursdays or whenever, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in church, I'm, I'm, I'm living for the Lord, but the rest of the week, you know, I'm, I'm doing all, all the things I shouldn't be doing. And, and you're trying to walk like this. And so it's no wonder when you stumble and fall. It's no wonder that you're not making the progress you could be making. And he says, look, you can't have it both ways. You can't drink at the, the, you can't go to the Lord's table with the devil's cup and say, hey, how's it going? You know, he's, gonna, he's, he's, he's not going to go with that. So he goes on and says, look at verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? That's, a, that's a questions we should probably ask ourselves if we find ourselves in that position where we're not living a separated life. Ask yourself, well, are you provoking the Lord to jealousy? You know what the answer is? Yes. And if that's the case, then you need to ask yourself, are, are we stronger than he? You know, and, and understand that, you know, if you resist God, he's going to resist you. You know, that God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So, you know, when you're, when you're not separating, you're uh, living a separated life, when you're allowing these old idols of your life, these old sins and habits and, and, and worldly things uh, that God disapproves of, when you just let that remain in your life, and even relationships, even, you know, and that's the hard thing. But, you know, especially this time of year, I hear about it so often where people are saying, you know, we used to go to our family Christmas, we used to spend time with our parents, but now the, 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 the you know, the gay cousin is there, the fag cousin. I shouldn't use that word gay. I should use the word fag. Yeah. That's what they are. He's showing up, you know, with, his, with his, uh, his husband and their adopted child. You know, that happens. You know, I just heard about that. Somebody was telling me about it. And that, you know what? <laughs> how, could you go, how could you go to that as a Christian, knowing what you know about the Word of God, and go there and be around that? You can't. How could you expect to enjoy yourself? No way. It couldn't happen. I, I mean, I would, I, if that happened, you know, if I showed up and, un, and they unknowingly into a family event like that and somebody like that showed up, I would lose it. I would probably just leave before I lost it. But I wouldn't stick around and, 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 and say... Because here's the thing. You say, well, I'll just go, but I won't say anything. Silent is, silence is agreement. Just by you going is like, oh, they're going to think. Whether you agree or not, they're going to think, oh, they're okay with this. You know, that's why we had to make a decision. Hey, we're not going to go to family functions where there's booze. That's every family function <laughs> in my family. In my extended family, not at home. Don't worry about what I'm doing at Christmas. We're keeping it clean. You know, there's going to be some honey glazed ham. That's about as indulgent as we're going to get. You know. I might get some grape juice. Who knows? But when you make that stand, you say, hey, the, I can't you know, continue on in these worldly relationships that God disapproves of. That's where the rubber meets the road in the Christian life. That's when it, it, it gets real. You know, and people, they don't want to make that separation because that's difficult. And I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's necessary if you're going to live that Christian life, if you're going to move on, or you're going to provoke God to jealousy. So you decide which one's worse. But ask yourself this, are you stronger than he? And you say, well, why is God jealous? Why does God expect that from me? Because he owns you. Because you're his. Amen. Because he bought you with the price. Which is what it says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you want to turn back there, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Well, I just don't think it's fair that God can just, you know, you know make these demands. And say that we should, you know, why did Jesus have to send a sword? Why couldn't he come with a, you know, a ukulele? and just serenade us. You know, why didn't, why didn't he just show up with a feather duster and, and, and tickle our toes or something? He showed up with a sword for a reason. Because he wanted to, and he says, look, if you follow me, there's going to be separation. There's going to be, and it's going to affect, every, it's going to affect your house. A man's foes shall be they of his own house. <clears throat> now, praise God if you've grown up in a Christian home where everybody's saved and everybody loves the Lord and is living for the Lord. That's great. You know, I didn't have that growing up, but I sure am enjoying raising some kids. I'm sure I'm enjoying starting that in my family. And, we, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the fact that I'm going to have some children and some grandchildren that they're not going to have to make some of the decisions that I had to make, uh, you know, in my Christian life. That they're going to be able to, they're, they're going to be able to come over to Grandpa Corbin's, you know, and with all their, their little cousins and not have to worry about whether or not I'm going to break out the Jack Daniels or I'm going to have the fag cousin over. 
you know, and, and just say, well, it's your problem, you know. <laughs> and that's how it goes, and, it, and you know it's true. Look here, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Flee fornication, every, man, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. People need to let that sink down in their ears. Well, why does God get to make all these demands on me? Why does God get to say, do this, don't do that? Because you're not your own. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. You know, what was that price? It was as the blood of a lamb. You know, precious blood of a lamb. It was the blood of Christ. So God, you know, he's a God. We see right here that he does not, he does not just share, you know, his glory with another. He doesn't leave space for us to just kind of sneak in, you know, our little heathen practice over here that, you know, well, I know I'm saved, but I'm still going to go to Mass on Christmas with, with Grandma because that's just the way we did. You know, don't do that. You know, that's, that's giving glory to another. And God, doesn't, God says, no, you're done with that. We're wiping this out. And why does he do that? Because he's a jealous God, and he bought you, and he wants all the glory for himself, and he's, he has every right to it. So, and he goes on here, and, you know, and he starts to... De he, he, God just demonst he's demonstrating here, what? His exclusiveness. That he is God alone, that there is none else. That, uh, that there is no other God besides him. And he does that by what? Demanding the destruction of all other false gods. He doesn't say, you know, keep, hang on to them. You know, he says he wants their names wiped out from the earth. I mean, we don't even know a lot of their names. Some of them we do just because they go back and start worshiping them. But I guarantee you there's just multitudes of false gods that these per people worship. Their name's just forgotten. You know, they're, they're, they're gone. And that's the way God wants it. Because God didn't even want their names to be, uh, the names of these false gods to be on the lips of his people. He says, don't even breathe their names. You know, in praise, obviously, if you're having conversation where you have to talk about it. But, <coughs> but he's saying, look, that he's demonstrating that he is exclusive. That he is God alone. And the other way that he does that is not just by the destruction of these false gods. But notice also in verse 5 that God limits the place of sacrifice. When he says, look, you're going to wipe out these other gods and then you're going to worship me. And notice in, verse, in, those, in those verses, uh, he's saying you're going to destroy all. Verse 2, all the places wherein the nations ye shall possess served other gods. So it wasn't that these, these nations just were going to one place. They had a multitude of places. They had the high places, the groves, so on and so forth. They, they had a multitude of places that they would go and worship these false gods. And God is saying, look, I, he's showing that he is exclusive, that he alone is God, not only by wiping them out, but when he says, and then you're going to worship me, he limits it to one place. He says, you're going to come to where I am and you're going to worship me in one place. Look there in verse 5 where he says, But the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek. And thither shalt thou come, and thither shall ye bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and he, oh, I'm, I'm repeating in verse 6, sorry, that was a that was, um, copy-paste mistake. But it, you could see there, like, God's saying it's going to be one place and you're going to have to bring all this stuff there. And he's saying, look, you're going to bring your heave offerings of your own hand, your vows, your free will offerings, the firstlings of your flocks, the burnt offerings, the sacrifices, the tithes. I mean, wouldn't it be just a lot more convenient if God just said, you know, we're just going to put up, I'm just, you can worship me in all these different places, whichever one's closest to you, you can just bring that stuff there. Because remember back then, they didn't, they didn't have, you know, the, they didn't have the 15 passenger Ford E350 XLT model, like we do, right? He couldn't just back up, you know, the, the, you know, the, the one ton box truck and load all this stuff up and just have a nice casual drive over there, you know, stop and get yourself a little cappuccino on the way. This was work. They had to load all this stuff up in wagons and on, on beasts of burden and cart it down there. I mean, this took planning. This took, you know, cost time, finances. There was the, I mean, the, the actual, you know, nuts and bolts of carrying this out were difficult. They were inconvenient is what they were for some people. And you know, what it shows us is the Lord isn't concerned with his worship being convenient for us. God didn't say, and I apologize for it being so difficult. No, he did that on purpose. He wants it to be inconvenient. He wants it to be difficult. 
well, not necessarily difficult, but he wanted it to cost us something is what I'm getting at. You know, it took effort to get to the tabernacle back then, didn't it? Because there was only one. Because God is exclusive. And that's what he's showing him. So look, I'm the only one. There's nowhere else to go. This is it. If you want to get with the true and living God, this is the place to be at the tabernacle. You know, <laughs> and that could show, that we could apply that today. You say, bring this into today's, you know, apply it into our, to our world today. Well, how about the fact that, you know, they had a lot of false gods back then, right? They were a dime a dozen. They're false gods. I mean, we read there, they were every high place. They had them everywhere. And uh, you know what? The, today, in the same sense, the, you know, there's an ecumenical church in every corner in America. Yeah. You want to go find a church? I mean, we could, we could put a blindfold on you, spin you out, and send you out the door. You'd run into one eventually. They're everywhere. I mean, we go to, we go to these other, you know, you go to these different parts of the country. There's, there's churches there. Every other corner. Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches. You know, and, and it's all, whatever, name your, whatever flavor you like, it's out there. And you can go have it. And it's going to be easy. <clears throat> that's, that's the same way today. But does that mean all those people are preaching the right thing? Does it all mean that they're all got the right gospel? No. That they're all teaching the true way of salvation? No. And even the ones then, are they actually teaching you sound doctrine? Giving you the meat of the word? Or are they just, you know, just some fun center? You know, a lot of them might have the right gospel, but then you go in there and it's just like, Hey, this is how you get saved. Come back next Sunday and I'll tell you how to get saved. And then come back Sunday after that and tell you how to get saved. And then Sunday after that I'll tell you how to get saved. And then Sunday after that I'll tell you how to get saved. And that's what some of these churches are like. And, or, they're, or they're bringing in some, just some worldly program. I remember when I, before I got into Baptist church, before I, you know, I, 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 was, I was looking and searching and I went to this, this, you know, the, what do they call it? It was Bay Point. Just any church that has point in it, look out. <laughs> City Point, Bay Point, Cross Point. Just all these point churches, you know, it's your point you the other way. <laughs> now, I'm sure there's a Baptist church out there with point, that's good. Don't, don't go railing on them. But, you know, I went to this Bay Point, and uh, I remember their Christmas service there. And it was the last service I went to. I went there, and they were meeting in a high school auditorium, hundreds of people in there, and they're in the stage, it lights up. And this teenage girl comes out in a baller, has a, she was a ballerina and, and dressed, you know, dressed as like ballerina's dress, which is immodest. Hello. And they went out there and dances her dance for Jesus. And now uh, little Miss So-and-so is going to come out and treat us to a special dance in honor of the Lord. And I remember just looking around going, how many men are in this place right now just lusting after this? Just looking at this, this young woman dressed up like that. I said, man, this, is, this isn't worshiping God. This is a joke. And that was the last time I ever went. Same place before that. They're bringing in, you know, they're, 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 they're going to R-rated movies. They're showing R-rated movie clips. Nothing, you know, explicit to illustrate their sermon. And I can remember it was some, I'm going to date myself here. It was some Julia Roberts movie. It was uh, My Best Friend's Wedding. I've never seen it except for when I went to that church. <laughs> I saw that much of it. And they're like, well, you see here how this character was envious and covetous of her friend's a blessing that came in her life. And, you know, God doesn't want us. When other people are, you know, just this soft spoken little ditty, you know, maybe they had salvation right, but they didn't, I mean, they didn't have anything else right. And that certainly wasn't pleasing to God. They'd be bringing in this worldly trash and trying to teach God's people. Why not just open up the book? I mean, are you that, are you that star? You can't find something out about covetous out of the Bible? You can't teach people about that using God's word? <clears throat> I'm going to end up going off on a rant if I'm not careful. But what the point I'm trying to make is those churches are everywhere in America. Now, how many independent fundamental Baptist churches are there that are actually got are right on the gospel and are actually doing the great are actually trying to do what God told us to do and reach the world with Christ? Few and far between. You know, I'm not saying there aren't any other ones in Tucson. I hope there is. You know, and <clears throat> I'm sure that there is. You know, I've never been to them, but I've heard that there's others that have soul winning programs that are King James only. Praise God. But we're in the minority, you know, and, and here's, here's what I'm getting at is that you might have to go to the distance to serve God physically, you know. You might, you know, you might have the church across the street and it's real easy to get there, but, you know, it's the United Methodist, uh, you know, Church of the, you know, Our Lady of the Abomination over there or whatever. Some wicked, un ungodly church bringing all kinds of damnable heresy. But, oh, but it's close. You know, and they got a nice song service. You know, they got ballerinas over there. 
We could catch up on the latest R-rated movie. Might be a fun time. But is it what God wants? <clears throat> you know, if you want to get in the right church, you might have to actually go the distance. Literally. <laughs> might have to put some miles on the wheels. You know, you might have to, you know, re-up the, uh, the, the warranty on your vehicle and say, well, you know what? It's going to be another 20,000 miles a year if we're going to go to church. <clears throat> you know, and I, thought, I saw a great example of this when I was in Pure Words Baptist Church down in Houston this last weekend. I think, you know, there were several families there, but I think only one of them lived within 15 minutes. Everybody else was driving like an hour. I mean, Houston's huge. It's hard to put a church in a, in a city that big, put it in the right spot, and, and please everybody with, how, with its locality. You just can't do it. It's impractical. If we're real close to this group of people, we're going to be even farther from this group of people. There were people driving an hour and a half. There was a people driving there two, three hours every week to get to church. How many churches do you think they passed on the way? That they could have just pulled in and say, well, I went to church and check it off. Maybe even Baptist churches. But they're dead as a doornail if, if, if they're even right on anything at all. They're, they're a dime a dozen. And the, what God is showing us here by putting the tabernacle in one place is that God is not worried about inconveniencing you when it comes to worshiping Him. Because God went out of His way, didn't He? Amen. I mean, Jesus sure went out of His way for our sake yep. when He left heaven and came down here and lived among men and died the death that he did. I mean, he, he certainly went the distance for us. And, and then we go, oh, i got to drive. I hear people all the time, well, you guys are like 30 or 45 minutes away from us. I'm thinking, you city slicker. 30, 45 minutes? When I lived in Michigan, everything was 30 or 45 minutes. You were happy if it was 30. Oh, it's only 30 minutes. Oh, great. You know? I mean, everyone who lives in the city, if it's not within 10 minutes, oh, that's too far. It's like, what in the world is wrong with you? You know, I, I don't understand it. But people, they'll, they'll, they'll just not go to church because they will you know, say, well, you know, I, I don't want to have to get up er that early on Sunday and, and just drive more than 30 minutes to anywhere. Well, shame on you if that's your attitude. Right. And, you know, that's not going to fly with God. You're not going to go to heaven and God's going to like, why weren't you in church? Why didn't you learn to serve me? Why didn't you grow? Well, you were, the only church was 30 minutes away. It was 45 minutes away. It was an hour away. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, you're right. Sorry about that. Well, you, you get a pass. No way. God's going to be like, so? And? You know? Ugh. There's no excuse. And, uh, you know, and, I, and that's what I love about our brand of churches is that people make the distance. They, they go the distance. They go the extra mile. Literally. You know, miles. And they get here. And because the, pro the problem today is that there's just too many people out there. They want a no cost Christianity. And there's plenty of churches out there. That's exactly what they'll give you. You can show up, come as you are, leave as you were. It won't cost you nothing. And you can pat yourself on the back and, and say, I'm living for, living for the Lord. And too many people out there want that. They want this no cost Christianity. Uh, I, I don't know if you're, I should have kept, have you kept something in there in the New Testament. Go back to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13. What did Jesus say in Matthew 10? We were reading earlier, going to Matthew 13. He said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He said, He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. There's too many Christians out today, they don't want to lose their life. They don't want to lose it for Jesus' sake. They don't want, and I'm not saying you know, lay their life down literally and you know, lose their head or something or be persecuted. I'm saying they want to stay selfish. They want to make life all about them. They don't want to make it about serving God. They don't want to be inconvenienced by God. They don't want to be inconvenienced by the church. They don't like when the preacher gets up and preaches on their sin. They don't like it when, when somebody says, thus saith the Lord. They don't like the commandments of the word of God. And so they just give up on it. And they just say, well, I quit then. It costs too much. It's inconvenient. And you know what? That's not the example of Scripture. So if we're looking for a no-cost Christianity, then you're not looking for a biblical Christianity. Because biblical Christianity will cost you something every time. It's the example of Scripture from cover to cover. I mean, we could start, we could start with Abraham. You know, God comes to Abraham and says, Hey, leave your, father, leave your kindred behind and go into a strange land that thou knowest not. And, and when you get there, then I'll tell you what's going on. 
I mean, people who can't go 30, 45 minutes, an hour to church, you think they're going to make that journey? No way. But that's biblical Christianity. And when we go through the Scripture, we see that anyone who has ever been used by God to any degree has paid a price for it. And they've paid the price. And, you know, we could, <laughs> one example would be the Apostle Paul. I mean, was Apostle Paul, I mean, arguably, you could say, the greatest Christian ever lived that we know of. Author of more books in the New Testament than anybody else. I mean, it saw, did miracles, preached great sermons, led thousands to the Lord, started churches everywhere. Just a powerhouse for the Lord. But did he not pay a price? Yeah. <laughs> he paid a price. Being stoned to death, shipwrecked, beaten multiple times, suffering, you know, perils in the deep, peril of his own countrymen, you know, it, you know, naked, destitute, poor, not knowing where he's going to lay his head down, not knowing where his next... I mean, that guy suffered for Christ, but he's also used. So, I mean, I, I could just imagine his reaction to some Christians that he would run into today. Where they're like, well, you know, Paul, they wanted me to go 30 minutes across traffic on a midweek service. I mean, I would just get there in time for the first song, Paul. You expect me to suffer like that? I mean, can you imagine Paul's reaction to that? Like, oh, you, you poor thing. You poor little deer. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. It's, it's, but people have this attitude. They want to know cross Christianity, and it's just not biblical. It's not the Bible, friend. I mean, you could talk about uh, David. Go back, go to Hebrews chapter 12. If you recall the story of David, when God, you know, when, when he numbers the people and God says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge you for doing this, you know, he sins. And he says, you know, you can have pestilence, you can have the wrath of man. And uh, he says, and, uh, and, and he, he chooses the, the angel of the Lord comes, right? And the pestilence, and he's killing the people of Israel. And, and David laments and says, you know, I'm the one who sinned the sin. What, what, what have these sheep done? And God, you know, repents. And he go, and tells him to go to, hey, go to the threshing floor where the angel stood. And that's where... Uh, uh, are you, uh, are you, uh, Aruna, Aruna was there, and he said, uh, Wherefore is my Lord the king come to his servant? So he's coming to this threshing floor where this guy was. And David said, To buy the fleshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. So he's come there to buy this threshing floor from him. And uh, are you, uh, Aruna said to David, uh, Let my Lord the king take and offer what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen and burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments for, of the oxen for wood. So he's not only willing to just, uh, and he, and just give all these things. And he says, all these things did Ariana, uh, uh, excuse me, Aruna unto, uh, as a king, give unto the king. And said unto the king, the Lord thy God accept thee. So he's saying, look, here it had the threshing floor. And you know what? You want to make a sacrifice? Here's the, here's the plow. Here's all the instruments that we use to, to bring in the harvest. Use that to burn the oxen and have a sacrifice. I mean, he's just giving this to David as a king gives unto a king, which is an interesting phrase. But he says, uh, but what does David say? Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. And just do it? No, if you recall the story, David says, nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Well, why is that? Why did David say, why didn't he just accept the gift? I mean, it was very generous. I mean, I don't even think there would have been anything wrong with that. But this just shows the type of heart that David had. He said, I will buy it of thee at a price. And he says, neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord of God, uh, of, unto the Lord my God, of that which just cost me nothing. He says, look, I'm not going to offer a sacrifice unto God when it doesn't cost me anything. What kind of a sacrifice is that? Could you even really call it a sacrifice? I mean, well, think about how we use that word today. You know, I'm going to make a sacrifice. It means it's going to cost you something. You know, you're going to give up something. It might be money out of your pocket. It might, it might be your time. You might be inconvenienced. You know, you're sacrificing your time, your energy, your resources to do something for somebody else. <clears throat> and that's what David's heart was. He says, look, I'm, I'm a, I want to be inconvenienced for God. I want it to cost me something. That's the heart he had. And that's a heart that anybody that's ever done anything for Jesus Christ has had. A heart that's willing to say, I want it to cost me something. You know, those people at, at Pure Words and other people, people even in this church who go to great lengths to be here, and, and, and sometimes I wonder why when I'm preaching, but just kidding. But, you know, I'm like, those people, are they're glad to be there. 
And they're, you know, why else would they make that trip? They want to be there. And they're happy to be there. And, and, it, it, and they have joy. You know why? Because they're serving God and it costs them something. They're making an effort. You know, it, that's the way it is in life. Anything that's, that, that's worth doing should cost us something. You know, if it's just, you know, they're saying easy come, easy go. You know, if it comes easy, it's going to go easy. But when you toil for something, when you put effort into it, when it costs you something, it becomes dear unto you. It becomes precious. It becomes a sacrifice. And that's the kind of attitude we have to have when we serve God. That's the attitude that Paul had. It's the attitude that David had. And not only that, it's the attitude that Jesus Christ had. Look there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's saying, look, here's your example, Christ. For who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied in your minds uh, and faint in your minds. Look at verse 4. And ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Look, I don't care what the Christian life is costing you. What it is, how inconvenienced you are. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You haven't. I mean, some people might, but I doubt anyone in this room has gone to that length. And he's comparing it to what Christ went through. Despising the shame of the cross. He endured a cross for our sake. Have we resisted unto that? Have we, ha have we resisted not doing the will of God to the point where we ended up you know, crucified? Striving against, unto blood? No. And Paul says that. He have not. Striving against sin. <clears throat> Well, the Christian life's just so hard. Tell it to Jesus. Go tell him about how hard your life is. Now, I'm not, I'm not making life of people's trials and tribulations. They are hard. But let's not get an attitude of, of just, oh, it's so difficult, I just don't know. You know. People begin to despair. And they just use that as their spiritual excuse to get out and to, rele and, and, and to excuse themselves from living the Christian life. <clears throat> and you know what? Well, go, you haven't resisted unto blood. And when you get there, then you, can, then you can talk to the Lord about it. Then maybe, then maybe God might, might lend you an ear there. The Bible says in Proverbs, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. You know, what's going to stop? What's going to take to stop you in the Christian life? What is it going to take to stop you? Uh, uh, yeah, an hour and a half round trip? That does it for some people. Well, I would serve God, but that is too far. You know, the inconvenience of, of look, and I'm not... And I don't want anyone to get the impression that I don't, that I, you know, feel like I'm inconvenienced for coming down here. It's my job to come down here. I love coming down here. But it's an hour and a half both ways. And to me, it's like going to get a jug of milk at this point. <laughs> <laughs> really, it is. It's just like I make that drive, I could do it blindfolded. Not that I have. <laughs> right? But I mean, I'm, oh, I better be careful what I say there, but, you know, I'm, I'm weaving in and out. I'm doing night now. I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, I, I, here's the thing. I tell some people that, like, oh, so do you live in Tucson? I, you know, I, got, I go to visit these other churches. I tell them what I'm doing, and they say, oh, so do you live in Tucson? No, I live in Phoenix. Well, how, how far is Tucson from Phoenix? Well, from this door to that door, and Faithful Word in, in Tempe, it's 102 miles. A little factoid. You don't get anything else tonight. You got that, right? It's about an hour and a half, give or take, with traffic and how fast you go. <laughs> and I don't recommend speeding on the 10. You know, nine, you're fine. Ten, you're mine. Just remember that. <coughs> that's what the, that's what I was always, I always abide by that rule and it's worked so far. But, uh, but I mean, I, I say that and people go, wow, 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 that's so far, you know. And then I think of Pastor Jonathan Shelley who goes from Dallas, Fort Worth to Houston once a week, which is four hours one way. <laughs> you know what? I bet he's glad to do it. I'm not saying he doesn't get, he probably gets weary, probably gets tired. I'm sure it's not easy on the flesh, but you know what? It's what we're here to do. Amen. To sacrifice. To have God cost us something. Have it cost us something to serve God. And when he gets there, just like when I get here, you know, well, I came all this way. We might as well do something for God. We might as well make it count. Because this is precious unto us. <clears throat> That's the example. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. Isn't it nice when you work really hard at something and you finally complete it? I mean, whatever area it is, you know. You can think about, you know, we got a lot of, of younger people that are, you know, that are in school. You know, you got some big test coming up. You got to cram. You got to study. You got to put all these hours in. 
You got to not go out with a friend. You can't got to not enjoy that extra hour of video games or whatever it is, whatever fun you had. You have to put that aside and really work on this to make sure you get a good score. Man, when that good score comes back, is that not sweet to the soul? You know, we, we, any area of life. I mean, think about child rearing. You know, it's just so easy to just, well, just let the kids raise themselves and just raise another spoiled brat. You know, but it's parents who want to get it done, you know, they get after there, they teach, they instruct, they correct, they love, they're patient, they're kind, they're firm, they do all this hard work. And then when they turn out a good, godly, Christian young person, I'm telling you what, that's going to be sweet to the soul. The desire accomplished, but you know what? It didn't come easy. It wasn't convenient. And anything in life that, that, that is worth having is not going to come easy. <clears throat> because it's challenging. And that is the Christian life. It's not convenient, and in fact, it's challenging. i got to move on here. I know I'm, I'm going long here, but go back to Deuteronomy. We'll get into verse 7. <laughs> Out of 30-some verses. <clears throat> the challenging Christian life is a rewarding life. That's what we need to understand tonight. Why does God say, hey, one place. This is the only place you're going to worship me when you get over there. It's going to be a challenge for you to get there. Because when they got there, it meant something to them. It cost them something. And it was a challenge. And I'm glad the Christian life is challenging. I'm glad it's not easy. Easy is boring. And we, I mean, yeah, it might, be, it might be nice sometimes. But easy is usually boring. You get, it gets dull fast. We want a challenge in life. You know, the Christian life is challenging, and I'm glad it is. He says there in verse 7, And therefore, and there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice. You know, so he's like, hey, when you get there, don't have this, mm, I made it, well, I'm here. He says, when you get there, rejoice. Yeah. You know, I made it to church today. Well, how much longer? You know, is that the attitude we have when we walk through the, 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 the doors of God's house? Or do we rejoice? Say, hey, I'm with God's people. Amen. Let's sing praise unto our God. I'm going to listen to preach the word of God. I'm going to learn something from the Bible today. You know, uh, and one thing I, I heard, and just so much of what I heard down at uh, Pure Words is just resonating with me the, when I read this, is that those people were glad to be there. And some people were like, yeah, we drive two hours to get here. But they weren't like, oh, we drive two hours to get here. <laughs> They're like, hey, we don't. I'm like, they weren't. They didn't come to me. I'm so like, I was trying to bum a ride back to the hotels. What's going on? I'm like, so which way do you live and how far? And you know, because I didn't want to inconvenience anybody. I don't think just because I come to town, everyone's got their lights got to stop. and They got to pander to me. But they go, oh, we you know we live uh, we live north. And I'm like, oh, how far? Oh, about two hours. And that's how they said it. And I'm like, you wouldn't believe how far we go. Two hours. Can you believe that? You know. And one somebody said, I can't remember who it was, but they said. And they're like, but you know what? At least we got a great church to go to. Amen. They were just glad to go to church somewhere. Because what's the other option? What if that church wasn't there? What if this church wasn't here? Where would you go? It's, it's, a, it's a jungle out there. It really is. You don't know, you know, you know what you're going to get anymore. <clears throat> you know, you can get some... Uh, anyway. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I don't want to go off. The point being, you know, it might be a challenge, but it's rewarding, okay? You know, you might have to go that extra distance, but when you get there, it's going to be rewarding. And you're going to do what? You're going to rejoice. And he goes on to verse 8, You should not do all the things that you, uh, we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right is in his eyes. Uh, and he goes on, let's just jump down to verse 12. And he says, And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And he says, look, when you get there, you're going to rejoice. And ye and your sons and your daughters and your men servants, your maid servants, and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part or inheritance with you. Uh, he said, Take heed thyself uh, unto thyself, not to burnt offerings uh, in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in any of thy tri one of thy tribes, there shalt thou offer thy burnt offerings, and there shalt thou do all that I command thee. So God is like, Look, it's not convenient, convenient when you get there, and when you get there. I'm going to tell you what to do, and you're going to do it. And that's the way it is today. You know, it, we get here, and the preacher gets up and says, let's say it the Lord. And you go, man, I drove an hour to get my face ripped. <laughs> yup. <laughs> and you, you know, I think that's bad. Try moving 2,000 miles across the country to get your face ripped. <laughs> that's what I did. And I left Michigan thinking some, like, some hot shot because I was just a, you know, uh, uh, you know, a big fish in a small pond. You get out there and you get around people who actually know the word. 
going to a preacher who actually you know preaches the whole counsel of God and doesn't you know you know is no respecter of persons, and you start to feel about this big, and you know, the pastor gets up and starts ripping on your sin, you're know, like. I drove 2,000 miles for the preacher to make me look like a dummy in front of my wife. <laughs> Good night. And you know what? He says, rejoice. Be glad. <clears throat> because it's going to challenge you. It's going to make you better. <clears throat> the Bible says in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, that every child would know that verse every Sunday morning. It's time to go to church. Not that it's ever a question in, in, in most people's houses. They know. But hey, get in. We're late. We're, you know, well, I don't know. Maybe you're not late. But we got to go. We don't want to be late, right? To the kid and the kids. Oh. <laughs> Here we go again. I don't know. Maybe it's just because mine are still real young. Man, they they look and they love that. Drive. They say to me, you know, Dad, we love going to Tucson because they got we got our friends down there. And they say, but that drive, that drive, Dad. I say, well, what's wrong with the drive? You get in and out on the way back. I'm like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. you know. Are we, is that our attitude? When, you know, Sunday morning rolls around, it's time to go to church. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> he said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. How's that for three, three to thrive? <laughs> all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord, to acquire in his temple. And you say, well, I don't know, it's just sometimes it's just such a drag to get the family, to get in the car, to get over here. It's so far, you know, I know what it's like to struggle with car seats. I hate those things. I hate them. You know? And, and everything that comes along with having to pack up a family and get, get somewhere. And you know what I never do though? Well, it's such a drag that I've got to go to Tucson and serve God with people that love God. You think that's a drag to me? No way. I love it. I look forward to it. I'm excited about it. I was excited writing this sermon so I can't wait to get down there and preach it. Because my heart's right with God. And if coming to church and being inconvenienced by God is a drag to you, your heart's not right with God. That's the way it is. <clears throat> and just remember, you know, we'll move on here. You know, we have to be willing to suffer the reproach, the inconvenience, but also the reproach. Especially this time of year, you know, of, of being the churchy one in the family, right? You know, he's the one that got religion, as they say. <clears throat> you know, well, Jesus suffered the reproach of the cross, you know. The Bible says, Wherefore, uh, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us uh, go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing the reproach. So, you know, we need to be able to be willing to bear that reproach, you know, again, especially to those around us. And I think especially this time of year to our immediate family. You know, what do you mean you don't drink anymore? What do you mean you're not going to play beer pong? You know? What do you mean you're not going to smoke this with me? Whatever it is. What, what, what do you mean you don't want to hear any more dirty jokes? You love you know, you Uncle so-and-so's dirty jokes. It was the highlight of the Christmas season every year. Right? <coughs> what do you mean you're not going to be there because of church? I remember when I started that, the whole, I'm going to church, I'm going to be there. And I'm not saying if you're not here three times a week that you're not right with God. But I'm saying some people, they, getting here one time a week can be a real struggle. And, you know, sometimes we let things become more of a priority to us than church. But sometimes, you know, when we decide, you know what, I'm going to be in church no matter what. When you decide that, and that's a decision people have to make, that they're going to be in church no matter what. Because life's going to come up. And when you decide that, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, when you get sick. Please, if you get sick, stay home. Don't come make me sick. Don't come make everybody else sick. And then next week, there's even less people here, okay? If you're sick, stay home. But I'm saying, you know, you stubbed your toe when you got out of the bed, and then we're like, oh, can't go to church, you know? Or we say, hey, nothing's going to get in the way. You know, <clears throat> hey, you know, your nephew's having a birthday party Sunday. It's going to start at 10.30. It's going to go all day. Oh, sorry, i got to go to church that day. You know, that's going to cause reproach. They're going to go, oh, excuse us for bothering you, for inconvenience you. They'll get the message eventually if you're consistent. But it brings a reproach, doesn't it, to those around you. <coughs> but you know what? God's not worried about inconveniencing you. 
God's not caught and not worried about making me, you have a little bit of reproach for going to church. He might get you that weird, weird look. Oh, you got to go to church every Sunday? The neighbors see you pulling out again <laughs> in, that, in that big vehicle with all those kids. There goes those church people again. Oh, it's Wednesday, you know, 7 o'clock almost. They must be on their way to church again. You know, they were just there Sunday twice. I don't know, you know. Don't bother inviting them to the, you know, the neighborhood potluck that day because they won't be there because they're church people, you know. And some people, they just, that, that's too much for me. Oh, I don't want to be considered a church person. You know, it might get you the weird look, but you know what? When you're pulling out of the driveway and the neighbors are, are, are watering their lawn on the Sunday morning, and then you, you go, see ya. <laughs> when you get here, there's joy. There's rejoicing. Yeah. Who cares about the weird look from the weird neighbor? <laughs> right? And people think, oh, it's such a drag. It's so hard to get there. And they forget how good church really is. And you know, if it really is a drag, you're not getting out of it, you know, you should probably search your heart because it should be a place that you come to and rejoice, even if it even inconveniences you. I mean, look here at verse 15. Tell me if this doesn't sound like a Baptist church. Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates. <laughs> right? I'm always about eating when I'm Baptist. <laughs> Whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessings of the Lord thy God, which he giveth thee. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as the roebuck and as the heart, and so on and so forth. And then he says, Only that uh, shalt not eat the blood, you shall pour it on the, water, uh, on the earth as water. Verse 17. Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn, or of thy wine, or of thy oil, or the first things of the herds of thy flock. Or of any of thy vows which thou vowest, nor free will offerings, or heave offerings of thine own hand. But thou, uh, but thou must eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Thy son and thy son, uh, thy son and thy daughter and thy maid servant, so on and so forth. So God's saying, look, it's not like you don't get to eat the rest of the time, but you're going to bring the tithe and the offering and everything to the place I determine. You know, he's talking about tithing there. And he's saying, look, you're going to bring it to me. You know, that's the one thing about tithing. That's one thing about tithing is that it gets you in church. You know, I, I'm not going to go off on tithing. I preached a whole sermon on tithing a few months back. But, you know, here's a little perspective on it. Because some people, they, this can be a real thing for people when it comes to tithing. You know, and people, oh, here you go. Here goes the preacher again about money. I never preach about money up here. Hardly ever. Give me a break. You know, your money perish with you if you got a problem with it. But here's, a, here's a, some perspective. Because I remember when I first started tithing, and I don't know if I made some, some you know, mum, grumbling remark to another brother in Christ or something, but he said, hey, just remember this, God lets you keep 90%. Right, At least it's not the other way around. Yeah. Where God's like, how about you give me 90 and you keep 10? Right? Well, at least God doesn't do that. You know, he's saying, look, you get to eat all this other flesh, but just bring the tithe, would you? Get it in there. And God lets us keep it. It could be the other way around. And think about the benefit from the tithe. You, did you know that we all benefit from the tithe? Yeah. It's not just the preacher. It's just not the pastor and the deacon and the people that are on staff. That, yeah, it pays their salary because everyone has a right to earn a living. And this is work, believe it or not. But, you know, everybody benefits from it. I mean, think about the fact that we even get to have a preacher. You know, that he gets to bring, you know, solid you know, meaty sermons that edify the body of Christ. Amen. Those don't write themselves. You know, it takes hours of writing and study and dedication of, 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 of digging in and, and you know, uh, uh, taking heed of the Word and, and, and not neglecting the Word, you know, of being with it. You know, having a preacher, how about having a building? Amen. Doesn't pay for itself, takes the tithe. Those nice, comfy chairs that you have, takes the tithe, you know? <coughs> And, you know, he says there in verse 19, Take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. So he's saying, look, don't forget to go and pay your tithe. Don't forget to get there and, and bring the offerings. Because back then, the Levite, he counted on it. He didn't have an inheritance among the brethren. He didn't have land. You know, he was counting. They, they were, they were going to be, uh, they were going to minister in the tabernacle and the things of God, setting it up, bringing it down, all the service thereof and the singing and the, the teaching of the word of God and the, making the sacrifices, that was a full-time job. And God's saying, look, if you, if you neglect that, you're forsaking your brother, you're forsaking the Levite, and you're forsaking God's house. And people are guilty of this today when they forsake church, you know, this house church movement. And their number one gripe is that they, they, anyone who wants to sit down in church, what they go after is the tithe. Because you're hard-pressed to find any church that doesn't 
preach that you should tithe. So if you can just say, well, tithing, I don't believe in tithing, and anyone that preaches tithing, I can't go to their church. You've just eliminated yourself from 99% of all churches. And now it's going to be you and, and a couple buddies in your living room. And you're going to call that church. And just remember this when it comes to the tithe. God wants the tithe, not the preacher. You know, I, I don't have any problem. I could do this and go work a full-time job and be glad to do it. And I'm thankful that, you know, I go to a church where this is my job. I pinch myself every morning and say, is this really my life? Am I really this blessed that I get to do this? And I'm very grateful for it. But I wouldn't have any problem if, you know, I had to move down here and become the pastor and go work a full-time job. I'd be glad to do it. And just remember, it's God that wants the tithe. And when you're robbing God, when you say, well, pff, we're not going to tithe. We're not going to go to church, you know. And I'm kind of going off of tithing. I said I wouldn't, but I did. Verse 20, he says, uh, When the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border as he promised thee, and shalt say, I will eat uh, flesh, because the Lord uh, thy soul longeth to eat flesh. Thou mayest eat flesh whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. So, you know, it's not like God is just telling them you're going to bring all this stuff and it's going to be hard and you're not going to enjoy it and you're going to just watch that Levite sit there and eat it in your face, right? He's saying, no, you know, you're going to get there and, and God's going to allow you to enjoy the fruits of your labor. God's going to let you eat with the Levite. That was what went on back then. You know, they got to go there, and it was for the poor, it was for the Levite, and they themselves got to partake of it. And that, my friend, is the Old Testament potluck right there. And that same thing goes on today. We're having, we, how many functions have we had where, hey, the church is paying for this, hey, the church is paying for that. You know, it all comes out of the tithe. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I've gone long already. I should probably just wrap it up right there. But, you know, God is not against you succeeding and enjoying the fruits of your labor. That was my next point. But uh, let's just go ahead and close the word of prayer. Dear Lord,